Tom says that that poverty used to mean hunger, inadequate clothing, and uh, inadequate protection against the elements. And that's what poverty was when Thomas Sowell and I were young. (laughs) It's not poverty today, is it, Tom? Oh, good grief, no. I mean, most of the people who are below the official poverty line in the United States have color color television, microwave ovens, and own either a car or a truck. Now, we didn't call that anything like poverty when I was growing up. Oh, that's right. And, and, and in some cases, uh, uh, according to a study by the Heritage Foundation, uh, I think 14, 16 percent of the people who are called poor, who fit the, de- the uh, census the, uh, definition as poor, uh, 14 or 15 percent have two or more cars. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> uh, I, when I was doing research, I found that, uh, uh, that hundreds, hundreds of uh, uh, thousands of people li- uh, with incomes below $20,000 a year uh, live in houses costing $300,000 or more. Now, as of the time I discovered that, I was living in a house costing less than $300,000. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, I think that one of the wonderful things about your, your, your writing is that, well, you're saying these, some of these things that we observe in United States are not unique to United States, and they're not by no means unique to, uh, to black Americans. And this book that you talk about in this particular column is called uh, Life at the Bottom by, uh, what is it? Theodore, Theodore Dalrymple. He's a doctor in a predominantly white, low-income neighborhood in England. Uh, he's talking about the same kind of things about lower-class whites in, uh, in England that we can say about the lower-class blacks and whites in the United States. Yeah, and, 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 and I think it may be easier for some people to understand w- w- what's really involved because so much of what is done in, in, in the black community that's counterproductive is, uh, taught, is uh, explained away as a, as a legacy of slavery or the, the Jim Crow and all that. And you see the exact same things happening in these lower class white uh, communities in England where none of those things apply. Uh, one, of the, one of the most striking is uh, the beating up of, cl- of uh, children in school by their classmates uh, when, when, the, when the children are trying to get a decent education. Uh, in fact, Dalrymple as a doctor has tre- treated many of these kids because they need medical attention. They've been beaten up that badly. And uh, when that happens in the United States, it's, it's called uh, the, they're accusing the, the, the student, black students who are trying to learn of acting white. Well, the whole racial thing is, is gone uh, in, in these lower class white communities. So really, this, this is not something peculiar to the United States. It's what happens when you have, one, a welfare state that allows people to live a counterproductive lifestyle. Uh-huh. And that welfare yeah. state is accompanied by an ideology that accepts apologize for, even glorifies that lifestyle. Also, we saw some of it in Britain uh, during the riots of last summer. Oh, yes. I love people who say well, these riots are a result of, of uh, anger uh, at poverty and so forth and so on. And uh, there's never been uh, so much anger as there is today when there's so little poverty. <laughs> That's right. And you see the rioters sometimes in uh, designer clothing. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, it's one thing back in the days when poor people were desperate and would steal bread. I, in all these riots that I know about, I have never seen anybody break into a bakery and steal bread. <laughs> They're stealing television sets and Xboxes and all this stuff. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> now, there's, a, there's another uh, very, very interesting article that you have in your book uh, uh, called The uh, Older Budweiser. And uh, and it goes back to uh, the you know way way back to the uh, the Habsburg uh, Empire where uh, Czechs and Germans people of Czech ancestry and uh, people of German ancestry speaking different languages uh, got to uh, you know got along very very well up until what up until you got a, a rising class of Czech intellectuals who resented the fact that they had to learn German in order to get ahead. Now, this they blamed on the Germans, but they should blame it on history. The fact is that the Western European nations had written languages centuries before most of the Eastern European nations, uh, mainly because the Romans conquered uh, Western Europe uh, and brought Roman letters. And when I told it was centuries later before they began to have letters for the uh, uh, languages of Eastern Europe. Well, what that meant was that if you wanted to learn, you know, science or any, any serious subject, you had a better shot at it if you learned uh, some Western European language, in this case German, rather than uh, be confined to the local language. And the Czech intellectuals started telling the, the Czechs and in, um, in, in Budweiser, saying, you know, 
you know, there had to be cultural identity. <laughs> oh, that, that, that is really locking people in a blind alley. I mean, this is, we, we call it multiculturalism today. To me, multiculturalism is like the caste system. It means it confines you to where you happen to have been born, regardless of how many opportunities there are in the world for you to advance by learning something else beyond where, where you were born. Yeah, right. And, and we see that in the United States as well. Oh, absolutely. And, 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 it's, and it's led by the intelligentsia in our country on college campuses. They even have uh, vice presidents for diversity. Oh, gosh. And, oh, yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, spending spending millions of dollars all over the country at universities by having all these nonsense offices that, that did not exist yesteryear. That's true. But the vast amount of money that they waste is really the least of it. What, what they really waste that's more valuable uh, is the time of the students who, you know, after all, are young and inexperienced. They may think it's wonderful to sit around and rap about uh, racial issues or, or uh, glass feelings and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but none of that is going to allow them to have a marketable skill when they leave that institution. And this is yeah. a problem. This is the problem in a number of countries, not, not just in the Habsburg Empire, but around the world and into the present time. That wherever you have a newly arising intellect, intelligentsia from some group that is poorer, uh, they typically uh, specialize in the softer subjects. They do not learn science, math, medicine, all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. They learn all kinds of stuff that's much easier. And then when they get out into the world and discover there's absolutely no demand for that kind of stuff, then they become identity uh, merchants. Uh, I think it's one of the things that uh, you're to be complimented on in the sense that you bring an international perspective to many of these problems that we face as a, as a nation. That is, uh, well, affirmative action is not only a disaster in the United States, but it's a, it's a disaster in India. It's been a disaster everywhere it's been tried, in, in Sri Lanka and all these other places. And I think that we gain something if we recognize that, well, gee, uh, these problems, these social problems or economic problems are not unique to any particular culture. Oh, a- a- absolutely. And most of the countries where they've pushed preferential policy for one group, they argue as if what's something peculiar to that particular country is the reason. For example, in New Zealand, they say, you know, there's the Treaty of Waitangi in 1843, <laughs> you know, and then that's why the Maoris deserve preferential treatment. Yeah. And here it's a- a- another rationale. In India, it's another. But whatever the rationale, the patterns are just painfully similar. That's right. And, and-, and a-, a scientist would not go... Uh, from um, uh, New York to London and saying, well, the law of gravity operates differently in London because of your, <laughs> your because of the Roman conquest. Yeah, yeah. <laughs>